Uh, my name is Joe Cena, President and CEO of the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, and I would like to welcome you here this evening to the 2021 Glendora State of the Schools presentation. Uh, this year's live webinar will feature our panelists, as you see here. Uh, first, you will hear from Dr. Geraldine Perry, the Superintendent President of Citrus College. Next, you will hear from Dr. Penelope De Leon, the Superintendent of Glendora Unified School District. And third, you will hear from Dr. Jeffrey Jordan, Superintendent of Charter Oak Unified School District. Then we'll end with a Q&A session, which I'll go over um, momentarily. But before we get started, I first would like to thank our sponsors of this presentation. Uh, the following sponsors help the Glendora Chamber with the support needed to continue presentations such as this, um, along with many other programs and services the Glendora Chamber has to offer our business community. At our presenting level, we have Athens Services, Southland Property, and SoCal Gas. And the supporting sponsors include Foothill Credit Union, Citrus College, Citrus College Foundation, America's Christian Credit Union, Tellworks, Maryland Sparks Agency of Farmers Insurance, Performa Quality Printing, Sport Clips Glendora, Banner Bank Glendora, Glendora Tire and Brake Auto Center, Gary and Linda Clifford, Emanate Health, Leon Lobb of Merrill Lynch Bank of America, Azusa Pacific University, Audison and Company, Property Management, and Raising Cane's Glendora. We truly appreciate the support of these businesses and value their partnership in helping keep the Glendora Chamber moving forward. So before we get started, a little housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this presentation let me make sure, yep, we are. And we'll be posting it on the Chamber's YouTube page and also on the Glendora State of the Schools website. Also the uh, question and answer portal is open. So as we're going through our, our presentations, if you have any questions, if you wanna type those in and then we'll go over them, you know, we'll, they'll either answer them typing and or at the end, we'll go through each one and, um, and give you an answer to those. Okay, so unless there's any questions from any anybody, looks like people are still coming in, so that's good. Okay, let me move some images around here really quick. And then first up, we're gonna hear from Dr. Geraldine Perry. Uh, Dr. Perry was appointed as Citrus College's seventh superintendent president in July of 2008. Citrus College serves the San Gabriel Valley communities of Azusa, Claremont, DeWarty, Glendora, and Monrovia. Nearly 20,000 students take advantage of the college's many degree programs and certificate and skill awards offered in career technical programs. Welcome, Dr. Perry. Thank you for being here tonight, and it is all yours. Thank you, Joe. Good evening, all, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm so grateful for the chance to talk about my favorite topic, Citrus College. But first, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Glendora Chamber of Commerce for organizing this virtual event. Great job, Joe. Joe, I think you can be a talk show host. It's always a pleasure to provide this update, and I'm pleased to share the screen with my K-12 partners tonight. I'd also like to recognize Dr. Pat Rasmussen, Citrus Community College District Governing Board President and Glendora Representative. We are grateful for her leadership, vision, and commitment to advance student success. Thank you, Dr. Rasmussen. Well, as you all can imagine, the outbreak of 2019, COVID-19, COVID brought us new challenges to communities across the globe, including Glendora and Citrus College. At Citrus College, the pandemic forced us to make the difficult decision to close our campus we quickly transitioned to a remote learning and working environment. Despite the obstacles this initially created, we made impressive progress this year. During the fall, we welcomed back to campus a small number of students and employees who were deemed essential by the state. Students in the allied health areas of nursing and dental assisting were able to complete their programs of study. Likewise, students in automotive technology were also able to continue their studies in person. I'm happy to share that with the recent guidelines issued from the state and Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, 
we look forward to welcoming more students and staff back on campus. In just a few weeks, visual and performing arts and kinesiology classes will be held on campus with safety protocols in place. During the pandemic, almost all of our support services transitioned online without interruption since March 2020. Faculty and staff have found creative ways to support student learning in a remote environment. We now have virtual counseling appointments, drop-in office hours, online workshops, virtual orientations, among other resources. Additionally, the college's financial aid department has worked tirelessly to award higher education emergency relief act funds to our students. Over $5.7 million were awarded to students to assist with their expenses related to food, housing, course materials, technology, and healthcare. And hundreds of Chromebooks were distributed to our students to support their online learning. While these are certainly unique times, Citrus College continues to provide excellent educational programs and services. The dual enrollment program is one such example. One of the first of its kind in the region, Citrus College's dual enrollment program allows high school students to complete college coursework. We currently offer dual enrollment classes at nine high schools within the district, including classes at Glendora High School. Since spring 2018, 182 Glendora High School students have enrolled in dual enrollment classes. During the 2019-2020 academic year, the college's dual enrollment program experienced significant growth, offering a total of 114 courses at our area high schools, and soon it will be growing even more. I'd like to share with you another innovative program Glendora students may find beneficial, the Citrus College Promise Program. This program covers the enrollment fees and other costs for first-time college students. It is supported by the Citrus College Foundation and the state's California Promise Grant. In addition to financial assistance, students of the Promise Program are provided a host of support services. To learn more about these programs, please join us for our virtual parent workshop next Wednesday at 5 p.m. or visit our website under School Relations and Outreach. Other examples of outstanding educational opportunities include Citrus College's STEM, or Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics program. The STEM program prepares students for their transition to a four-year institution and gives them the confidence and the credibility needed to succeed. I'd like to highlight some of the STEM program aspects. How Pathways to STEM partnership with the Jet Propulsion Lab and Oakcrest Institute of Science provides our students with on and off campus science research experiences. Citrus College's PAGE Mathematics Program, which stands for Pre-Algebra, Algebra, Geometry Enrichment, provides math skills to fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students within the Citrus Community College District. The Summer Research Experience is another STEM opportunity, which places Citrus College students in paid eight to 10 week full-time assignments at prestigious research sites throughout Southern California. And the STEM TRIO Support Program offers a variety of services tailored to meet the individual needs of students majoring in STEM or allied health fields. If these incredible STEM opportunities aren't enough reasons to be excited about Citrus College, I have more good news to share. There has been impressive progress in new curriculum and program development. New associate degrees for transfer were created in child and adolescent development, environmental science, geography, and music. Now Citrus College students have the opportunity to choose from 65 different associate degrees or 29 associate degrees for transfer. In addition, 46 new courses were developed in cosmetology, journalism, music, construction management, and Italian. Well, as you can see, the pandemic has not slowed down the Citrus College faculty and staff. And I'm happy to also report that the Citrus College class of 2020 was rather industrious and had remarkable outcomes. The class of 2020 was awarded close to 2,500 associate degrees, more than 2,100 certificates of achievement, 
and 526 students graduated with honors. The degrees and certificates these students earned were in a variety of programs. The top degree programs in 2020 were business administration, social sciences, psychology, sociology, and administration of justice. Of course, earning an associate degree is just the first step. The majority of our students transfer to a four-year college or university upon graduation. And our graduates transferred to some of the best universities in the state and nation. In 2020, the top five transfer institutions were Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State LA, Cal State Fullerton, UC Irvine, and UC Riverside. Well, as you can see, the entire Citrus College community met unique challenges and tackled ambitious goals this past year. I thank our faculty and staff for their dedication and perseverance. And I am grateful to the Citrus Community College District Board of Trustees for their leadership. The success of Citrus College is due in part to the wonderful support we receive from our community. I want to extend my thanks to the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, my colleagues of the Glendora City Council and my K through 12 partners and the wonderful supportive residents of the Citrus College community. I thank you for caring about the quality of education in our community and lending your support. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this update tonight. Thank you, Joe. Okay, well, let me, thank you, Dr. Perry, for your, your presentation there. Um, you know, a lot of great information and um, we truly appreciate you being here this, e this evening. Okay, well, let me move some pictures around here. We'll go on to our next speaker. Okay. Actually, let me let me come on while I'm talking too. <laughs> okay. Well, next up, we have Dr. De Leon from Glendora Unified School District. Um, as a public school educator for nearly 26 years, Dr. De Leon has served as a high school teacher, assistant principal, principal, secondary instructional specialist, director of professional development and assessment before becoming the superintendent of the Oxnard Union High School District and now Glendora Unified School District. Uh, welcome Dr. Dalio and thank you so much for being here tonight and it is all yours. Thank you, Joe, so much. I really appreciate you and the chamber sponsoring this event tonight so that we can update the public on everything we're doing. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, first of all, I do want to give, extend my greatest thanks to the Glendora community and um, our wonderful board of trustees who represent our community every day and help us make uh, an impact for our students, a positive impact for our students. Uh, I want to quickly acknowledge our board president, Ms. Sandra Borg, Vice President Robin Merkley, um, our clerk, Dr. Rakshan Fernando, um, and members um, Ms. Elizabeth Reuter and Mr. Corey Ellenson. Thank you all so much for your vision and um, your dedication to this district. Thank you. Next. I also have to say how grateful I am to work in this incredible Glendora community. Um, it has been a challenge uh, since the pandemic but an absolute joy. And I look forward to a long future working with this great community. And I thank you. Um, I also have to give my thanks to our incredible employees. We have 702 uh, amazing employees who have um, provided an outstanding education for our students all the way through, um, starting with distance learning and then moving in uh, back, phasing back into in-person instruction. Uh, we have uh, as you can see, 365 certificated staff and 335 classified support staff. And I just have to give a shout out to our teachers, our support staff, our uh, wonderful administrators at both the site and the district for helping us get through this pandemic and be able to reopen our schools. And we are happy to be doing that soon. Um, I have to thank our wonderful parents, PTAs, our PTA council for all that they do. Um, day after day during this pandemic, they have been out in front of our schools helping to distribute materials um, and just all the other wonderful things they've done to support our students. I thank you. 
Um, also, I have to thank uh, the, our, our partners at the City of Glendora, the Glendora Chamber of Commerce, our City Council, um, and then of course our wonderful Glendora Education Foundation who has really come through for us to ensure that our students had the technology that they needed um, to be able to go uh, into distance learning and, and be able to thrive during this pandemic. Um, and then also the many, many philanthropic organizations that um, provide support to our district um, and particularly coming up in scholarship season. So thank you so much to all those organizations. Next. So just qu a quick demographic review of our district. Uh, we have a population of 7,116 students. And for those of you who ever want to know about our demographics, you can get all of this from the California Schools Dashboard. Um, we have a, a, pers a, a population of socioeconomically disadvantaged students of 28.7%, students with disabilities, 14.8%, English learners, 5.4%, um, foster youth, 04 and homeless youth, 0.2%. Um, I do suspect that this has increased and will increase for our latest upload of the dashboard later this year. Um, uh, we have done a lot of work to reach out and try to identify students who've been impacted by the pandemic. Um, we have a Hispanic population of 45.4 in our student population. Um, white students, 35.9. Asian, 9.6. Two or more races, 5.3. Filipino 2.1, African American 1.3%, American Indian 0.2, and Pacific Islander 1%. As you can see, a very, very diverse population in Glendora Unified School District. Next. We are very, very proud of our schools, as you can imagine. Um, I will, of course, give a shout out to our uh, wonderful schools tonight. Um, beginning with our Williams Preschool Sprouts and Daycare Program. For those of you who don't know, they have been up and running pretty much every single day during the pandemic, providing daycare for our essential workers, including our own staff uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, hats off to Williams uh, Preschool and Sprouts and Daycare. Also, all the staff and students and um, our amazing side administrators at Cullen Elementary, Lafetra, Sellers, Stanton, and Sutherland, who have um, really worked so hard uh, to um, give our children the absolute attention and education they need during this pandemic. For those people who say we haven't been in school, we've been in school, we've been online, and our teachers have done an outstanding job of providing. Um, education to our students when we have been in distance learning. Um, next. Um, also, shout out to our middle schools, Goddard and Sandberg Middle School, um, who uh, also have done incredible work throughout uh, providing supports for our, our students. Uh, many of you uh, may, may not know that uh, there were many um, uh, middle school students who participated in our teen center uh, that was held at Crowther. And another shout out and thank you to the city for partnering with us on Crowther to provide support for our middle school students that were there. And I think even a few high school students dropped in occasionally throughout this uh, time in virtual learning. Our high schools, Glendora High School and Whitcomb High School um, also. Um, and Whitcomb that has not just a continuation school, but a thriving independent study program. Um, some of you may or may not know that this year we were very proud to open the Glendora Online Academy of Learning. We call it GOAL. We have a number of dedicated teachers teaching in GOAL, which is our virtual online academy. Um, uh, hats off to that staff that really got it together in a very short period of time to ensure that students who wanted to go online and work in an, a more independent study program online during the pandemic were able to do so. Um, so thank you uh, to everyone involved in GOAL. And then of course, our wonderful adult education program. Next. Um, so a reopening update. I think everybody is most interested in knowing uh, where we are with reopening our schools for in-person instruction. So first I wanna talk about where we've been. So as you know, during the summer, 
our schools, the state was put on lockdown and our schools were closed. Um, and so throughout the pandemic, we have very closely followed the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health guidelines and health orders um, that really have given us uh, really our marching orders in terms of what we were able to do uh, with bringing students back. Um, so while we were in the pur purple tier, every opportunity we got we, to bring students back, we took that opportunity. Um, of course, I mentioned our daycare, which remained open and um, had special licensing to be able to do so during the pandemic. Our small cohorts of intensive needs students who came back on October 18th, 2020, 2020. And then also um, our phased in return of our TK6 students that began on February 18th, uh, 2021 with TK and K. Really, again, just have to thank our many dedicated teachers who have been uh, ready and willing to come back to service as needed um, and, and really uh, help our students phase back into in-person instruction at every opportunity. I do thank you for that. Um, on March 15th, we, as you mostly know, we moved into the red tier. Um, that same day, we were given red tier guidance uh, from the Los Angeles Department of Public Health. Um, that guidance said we could bring back secondary schools and we were thrilled. And then less than a week later, or about a week later, we received our guidance from the California Department of Public Health, allowing us to provide three feet of social distancing in our classrooms, meaning that we were able to bring our students back in a non-hybrid full um, reopening situation because our, our classes, our students fit with three feet. Um, and really the entire time, for those of you who don't know, the real issue of bringing students back has been the social distancing requirement. And we had planned for a full hybrid, um, thinking that we would not be able to fit our students in and we would have to split between A and B cohorts. And we were absolutely um, thrilled that the recommendations according to the health department and which, which initi initi were initiated by the CDC said that we could bring, um, have three feet and therefore we were able to bring our students back. So I know this has happened very quickly um, for our parents and our staff. Um, and I, of course, due to the fact that we've moved through tiers and have received guidance very, very quickly. Um, but as we've committed, the board and I have committed since day one that we would follow the health orders and that we would do everything we could to bring students back the very minute that we were able to bring them back. And so on April 12th, we will um, bring our students back five days a week for four hours a day um, in the morning um, to our schools. Our students are coming back and we could not be more thrilled with that. Our students at the end of the day will grab a grab and go lunch um, that is to prevent the mixing of cohorts that we cannot supervise during lunch on our campuses. Um, we will continue our Wellness Wednesday program, um, but it won't be just on Wednesdays. It'll be throughout the day on campus and also uh, in the afternoons when you get back home. Um, those activities will continue, um, as well as tutorials for our students and all kinds of other ex uh, activities like clubs which our students have really valued throughout the pandemic. Um, and then of course, our families may choose to stay in distance learning and we will continue to provide a remote learning environment for students whose families decide that that is what they wanna do. But um, nevertheless, we are thrilled to have our students back. And I'll tell you why, because as a lifelong educator, and I think everyone would agree with me and including the board, we know the best place for our students is in our classrooms. When our students are with us, they have access to a vast network of supports, of in-person supports. They have teacher, their teachers, counselors, uh, our support staff, their administrators on campus, and their peer network, which is also important for the socio-emotional health of our students. Um, so many more things available for our students when they're with us, and we know it's best for them to be on campus. So we are thrilled to be able to bring them back for five days a week, beginning April 12th. Next. 
I'm also very, very proud that Glendora Unified um, School District was approved as a LA County vaccination point of dispensing. Um, we applied and thanks to the hours and hours and hours of work uh, by our district uh, nurse, Sonia Delaquila and her team, uh, to date, we have administered 667 doses to our teachers, support staff, and also their eligible family members. Um, and we have nearly 600 more um, to administer in the upcoming week. So we're really, really proud of our ability to provide vaccinations for our staffs. Um, and then we will be available for other eligible groups in the community, including our own 16 and above students uh, here in the ne next few weeks. I'm sure you all heard that April 15th will be open for six students 16 and above and we'll be there and open and ready to provide them with their vaccinations as well. Cross our fingers. Um, also, uh, we are very happy to have a have partnered with Dr. Ravi and his Little Stars Clinic. Uh, for our COVID testing. Um, and they both come to our district office and do testing every Wednesday. Um, but our, our students and staff can go to his office, his clinic at any time and get COVID tested free of charge um, to ensure that our, our staff and our students are safe, particularly as we are returning back to school. Um, we, we've been really thrilled with that. And then also uh, incredibly, uh, Dr. Ravi and his staff have been able to come out to Glendora High School and test our returning athletes as they return to competition, which has made all the difference. Um, before we got to Red Tier, they were required to be tested and there he was with his clinic and it was an amazing effort. So thank you so much, Dr. Robbie and your entire staff. Next. Looking forward, I sure am looking forward to moving on out of this pandemic getting back to normalcy um, and ensuring that we are able to go back to all the amazing, amazing traditions that Glendora has to offer. One of those tra traditions happens to be our graduation ceremony, uh, ceremonies at our high schools. And I have to tell you, I am so pleased to announce that we will have in-person ceremonies this year. Now, they will likely be in multiple sessions because we will have limitations to the percentage of folks who can be in the audience. Um, and we will still have social distancing on the field, um, but we will be in person location to be announced on June 9th, 2021. So very happy, very excited to announce that. Uh, also looking forward to a robust summer school session. Um, we will have two sessions this year we will be in person. Um, we will likely have a few credit recovery courses that are offered online through our credit recovery program for seniors who need to catch up. Um, but for the most part, our summer school will be in person. And really the thought is uh, for some students they, who really struggled uh, being remote during the pandemic, um, providing a remote um, summer school would probably not help them. Uh, with learning loss. And so we will be offering two summer school sessions, June 10th through 25th, uh, June 28th through July 14th, and then possibly even a third one for Glendora High School. Um, we are also trying to work on putting together some one week STEM and arts fun and learning sessions during the summer. Uh, we also call them passion projects for our teachers, hoping we can get some teachers to come out and do fun arts projects for a week at a time, maybe guitar lessons, maybe build rockets uh, or robots um, and uh, so that students are really having fun as they learn throughout the summer. So really proud of that work we're working on right now. And then I'm, I'm also pleased to announce that the first day of the 21-22 school year will be August 25th this year. And we are looking forward to that being uh, fully in person. Um, of course, of course, we have to plan for all possible scenarios. As we know, there could be other surges, um, crossing fingers and toes that there are not, because I think we all have become very disciplined and are very safe. Um, so only good thoughts going towards starting um, in traditional education in the beginning of the school year next year. 
while planning for the others, just in case. Next. So I also wanted to let everybody know that even during the pandemic, even though our priority was everything related to COVID and, and to providing the very best educational program we could during the pandemic, we also have district overarching goals we all, that we call LCAP goals that we've been working on this entire time. And so I wanted to just briefly review those with all of you and let you know that we have been working on these and we will continue to work on these um, throughout the school year and they will continue on through next year. Of course, we're going through the LCAP stakeholder process as we speak and uh, you'll be uh, invited to uh, attend meetings to give us input into um, how to revise our goals or are, are there other goals we'd like to add? Um, are there goals we feel are maybe um, are obsolete and we, we should remove them? So we're, we, uh, we really do um, appreciate the input of our community and you'll be getting information about those stakeholder meetings very soon. But just to review some of those goals, the first one being student achievement through college and career readiness. Um, this is a really important goal. This really guides the work. The work of the district is to ensure that every child is able to um, reach his or her own greatest potential upon leaving our schools and be set up for the week following graduation. Um, everything actually starts, our work actually starts after graduation in, in ensuring that students are prepared for that and prepared for their lives as productive thriving, fr thriving adults who are on a path to career and college. So uh, that is our work and that is a TK-12, PK-12 uh, proposition. It's, um, so part of that work is to expand our CTE pathways. We've already begun that partnership and that good work with Citrus College. Many thanks to Dr. Perry and her staff who have just uh, welcomed um, our desire to expand with open arms. So thank you so much. Uh, increasing vocational opportunities and dual enrollment. Uh, we are by no means under any impression that every single student needs a four-year degree. I think every single child needs to go on to college or career that leads to gainful employment, doing what they love and what they're interested in. Not every career you love requires four years of college, but we want to support our students in whatever it is they want to do. So that may include uh, providing um, industry certifications, pathways to Citrus College for those wonderful associate's degrees, associate's degrees to transfer, uh, you name it. We want to provide every possible opportunity for our students, and that's a lot of work. And um, so it's already starting. We're really thrilled. Um, also, in order for students to be successful, we need multi-tiered systems of support to address learning loss, supports for students with disabilities, and English learners. Really important. Um, providing a comprehensive de professional development opportunities for teachers, uh, which support best practice for 21st century learning. I know we're pretty far into the 21st century now, but we really do, um, that's probably the point. It, the the, the um, skills our students need and the careers of the future continuously evolve. And we wanna be able to keep our students current and looking towards the future. And then also promoting internal leadership development. I'm very thrilled to announce that we have reactivated the Glendora Aspiring Administrators Academy, which we have almost 40 uh, employees, both certificated and classified participating so that we are able to really um, enhance our leadership throughout the district and hopefully grow our own for the future. Next. Next goal, safe and healthy 21st century learning environments. Um, providing social emotional learning will be even more important now that we come back um, from um, distance learning and we are working on a comprehensive mental health supports. We added a lot of mental health supports, many thanks to our wonderful wellness coordinator, Lucia Fernandez, and all of our amazing counselors throughout the district and our mental health partners. Uh, we will continue to uh, expand and enhance those for when students come back, understanding that it will be needed. Um, we also need to conduct and implement a facilities needs assessment and facilities improvement plan. 
ensure uh, sustainable technology infrastructure for 21st century learning. Uh, when you have to bring all of your students and teachers and they all have to be online and have laptops and Chromebooks, you also have to make sure the infrastructure is there, that there's wireless access points and plenty of bandwidth. And we need to make sure we continue to sustain that and maintain it um, for our students. And then of course, ensuring that all of our site and district safety plans and protocols are implemented and updated with most current practice and safety measures. Next. This is a big one. This is one that has come up over and over again is our community really wants um, us to have a goal around community engagement and collaboration, communication, really important. And what we've learned through the pandemic is that we can't give enough information. And I have to tell you, it was a bit like uh, drinking water from a fire hose at times. The information was coming so fast and so much and changing so often. It was almost, it's almost at times hard to keep up with, um, but I'm so happy to have, uh, be able to have um, the support of our new director of community communications, community uh, engagement and partnership development to really help us focus on this top priority um, that our parents and our community have mentioned over and over again that they wanted uh, really excited about uh, Ms. Thrower's work in that area. Um, and she's actually on tonight running my slides for me. Thank you, Alexis. Um, we also want to provide multiple opportunities for stakeholder input through a comprehensive community engagement plan, um, provide collaboration with our employee groups and support to support our teachers, administrators, and support staff. We are very fortunate to have very collaborative relationships with both the Glendora, Glendora Teachers Association and the California School Employees Association. And thank you to those groups so much for all your hard work during this pandemic. It has been something else. Um, and then also uh, really happy at, to be working to engage with our higher education partners. I mentioned Citrus College, also many of the universities um, and business community and philanthrop philanthropic partners to increase um, not just uh, the benefit to our students, but also opportunities for them for their future career paths. We would love to develop a system of apprenticeships and internships in our local community businesses. So really exciting stuff we're working on there. Next. And then lastly, but certainly not leastly, um, fiscal solvency. Glendora Unified School District has a budget of 78 million dollars. Um, we did receive CARES money, uh, CARES Act monies uh, this year and um, for next year, which will ensure that we're able to provide all of the supports needed for the pandemic. Things like buying uh, individual size desks and tables, PPE uh, equipment, technological equipment, um, you name it, everything under the sun to ensure we can bring our kids back. Those funds are very, very restricted. Um, we uh, also want to analyze, implement uh, strict internal checks and balances, align our fiscal resources to our district goals and priorities and through that stakeholder input, um, explore and, and secure grant funding to increase revenue. Uh, this year, our staff, our incredible staff has written for um, multiple grants and we have received many uh, to totaling $1.65 million. So that's an increase in revenue. I'm so proud of our staff for taking the initiative to write those grants for our district. Because as you know, we don't receive the supplemental and concentration grants of, of districts that have a higher rate of poverty. Um, so being able to supplement our revenue whenever possible is critical. So really happy about that. Uh, we're going to work on ensuring facilities maintenance and improvement, including our fields and athletic facilities, much of this in partnership with um, the city of Glendora. We're working on an MOU right now to, to really help improve the uh, availability of our fields and athletic facilities for our community. And then also, I think this is really important and this is um, addressed the long-term several years now, I think over seven years, we've had declining enrollment uh, in Glendora. Uh, unified School District um, for different reasons. One of them is just a declining birth rate in the community. Uh, others 
you know, there's uh, online schools are very popular now, um, but we are addressing that through attrition, uh, meaning that um, as people retire or leave the district, we try to be very disciplined with not replacing if, if at all possible, um, because we are under enrolled at this, at, at this date. And then also uh, innovative programming and hoping, not hope, hope is not a strategy, but planning uh, to do, to open some innovative programs in our district. Namely, I think we're going to be working very closely on a dual language immersion school and also potentially at a later date, a STEM academy. So all of those things are exciting things that hopefully will bring students to Glendora Unified School District because uh, we are proud of our schools and we know that when students come to our schools, they get an absolutely outstanding education. So thank you, next. So I just, again, that is it for my presentation tonight. I know it was a lot of information, but thank you all so much again for everything to the entire Glendora community for your patience as we have moved through the tiers to bring our students back. And my contact information is there, PA Delion at glendora.k12. Uh, no, not .com, .ca.us and my phone number for, for future reference. Thank you so much, Joe, I appreciate it. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Dalen. That was a, a lot of information. And um, we got some questions here, which we'll go over sure. uh, right after uh, Dr. Jordan speaks. And then, um, but if you wanted to review, review those and then we'll, we'll go over them. I will, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let me change some screens, screens around, do this. There we go. Okay, next up we have Dr. Jeffrey Jordan. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, for being here tonight. Um, Dr. Jordan took the reins as a superintendent of Charter Oak Unified School District on December 1st, 2019. And then I remember that that year, one month later, we asked him to do this presentation. So he did, he did a great job one month in. Um, he brought 30 years of K-12 experience and a stellar reputation for establishing collaborative working relationships with teachers, staff, and parents across the district. Um, welcome, Dr. Dr. Jordan. Thank you for being here, and it is all yours. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Just want to again start out like my colleagues have echoed the fact of just thinking Joe and the chamber and, and the city of Glendora, just we've been uh, what I consider to be great partners and just appreciate that support. and. Just want to also thank Dr. Perry for all the work that she does at Citrus to help all of us as well. And, and just what a great uh, organization. And then Dr. De Leon, welcome to the to the area or back to the area. Uh, we're glad to have you. And uh, so following these two presentations are, are challenging because they both did such an amazing job. So I hope that I can uh, can keep up with them. But before we get started, I just wanted just to take a moment, you know, this past year, obviously for everybody in our country, our, our state, our local community has obviously been um, a huge challenge and, uh, you know, a very personal challenge for, for many of us. And just recognize the fact that uh, many of us, through this virus have been impacted with families and friends and, uh, you know, it's real. And just on behalf of our board of education and myself, just want to let all of our community members know that our thoughts and prayers are with all of you. If any of the family members have, uh, you know, had any significant challenges with this virus, and it's been just really devastating. So, just want to start out by just saying that um, as we move forward in our presentation, I always like to start with a slide like this, just because this kind of reminds me every day of why we come to work and, and what our purpose is. It's about kids, and in Charter Oak Unified, that's what we're really excited about. Is um, the work that we do and the decisions that we make are really centered about how do we give the students in our district the best education and the best experience possible. And that goes all the way from uh, what takes place in the classroom to outside the classroom. And so um, we just need to remember that these guys' little faces is why we, why we do what we do. Uh, just a little background um, quickly on our district. We are a small district, we're 4,500 students. You can see our breakdown in terms of our, our students that are either English learners, homeless, social economic and disadvantaged, as well as the demographics of the students that comprise our 4,500 students. 
uh, we've got an incredible preschool program and, um, and a before and after school daycare program. And then we also offer five elementary schools. You can see the schools that we provide uh, at those levels. These are all award-winning elementary schools that just do a tremendous job welcoming kids in all the way from TK. And we do run our students all the way through the sixth grade in Charter Oak at the elementary school. And then from there, they transition to our middle school. We have one middle school, Royal Oak Middle School, and that's a seven, eight school. And then they move on to our comprehensive high school, which is uh, Charter Oak High School, about 1,400 students. And that's our comprehensive setting. And then we have three small schools that make up our alternative school. And that's our Sunflower uh, Alternative. Uh, we've got Bridges and Arrow High School. But the one that really has been established for a long time in our alternative setting is our Oak Knoll Virtual Academy. Uh, we are about nine years experienced in our virtual academy, and I got to tell you, it paid off. Um, unbeknownst in, to all of us with this pandemic, our enrollment in our virtual academy from basically from all over Southern California, it grew by almost an additional 200 students than when we started uh, a year ago. And uh, it's incredible because you figure no matter where you live, you can go to an award-winning online virtual academy and uh, it's established with a curriculum and experienced teachers and it doesn't matter where you live. Uh, and we've got just a, a great experience that we provide those kids. We also have an award-winning adult education program, which was started about three years ago. And prior to the pandemic, uh, we have over 600 people enrolled in our adult ed and it's a great service that we provide to our community. So we're especially proud of that program as well. We've got just under 600 staff members. You can see our breakdown. We've got about 240 certificated and 300 classified staff. And then uh, I'd like just take a moment to recognize our Board of Education. These are my five bosses. Um, this year, we um, actually welcomed two new board members uh, to our board. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we also had two longtime board members, Jane Bach and Brian Akers, who after over 20 and 25 years of experience, they retired this year. Uh, so this year, our board president uh, is Mr. Greg Peterson. And then our vice president is Mrs. Jeanette Flores. And then new to the board this year is a Charter Oak alum, Dr. Christian Aguilar. And then also uh, Mrs. Kristen McGuire is also new to our board. And then longtime board member, Mr. David Rose. And so these are the five board of education members. I uh, just want to take a moment also to thank them for this past year. Um, you know, the decisions that I have had to bring forward to them for them to make, um, like all of our boards and all of our districts, have been very uh, challenging. And, and there's been some really tough things that they have had to really make some decisions on. And I just appreciate their leadership and their ability to um, have a vision for our district that supports kids as well as our employees. And as we wrap up with this part of it, um, as, as both my colleagues have mentioned, what a challenge this year. Um, whoever knew that we would completely shut down our entire school system and overnight train teachers how to teach virtually but more importantly, how we all of a sudden welcomed our parents and our guardians into the classroom uh, for our little ones and, and, and made them partners. And I go out to probably do, oh, twice a week uh, virtual visits uh, in our schools. And it's just incredible watching the work that our staff has done, not only with our teachers and our principals, but our support staff, our counselors, psychologists, uh, speech pathologist. It's just truly incredible how we shifted and we stepped up to the plate to be able to provide a, what I believe was the best service possible for our kids. And they work hard. Matter of fact, we're on spring break this week. And, and we uh, certainly welcomed all of them and encouraged all of them to take this week off. Don't get on your devices. Just relax this week and, and don't Zoom. Don't do anything but get yourself refreshed for when we bring our kids back, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I also wanna thank our parents and all of our, our support and our guardians. Um, 
again, just making sure that the kids are getting on, making sure that they were able to log in, uh, you know, the little ones having supervision at home. We know that it's been an extreme challenge on our families who are trying to work, trying to take care of household needs, but then at the same time partner with us to be a teacher, if you will. And uh, I really am extremely appreciative of our of our community for the work that they've done and the support that they've provided. So when I first came back, as Joe mentioned, I started on December 1st of 2019 as the superintendent. And within my first 90 days, uh, I made it a challenge to meet with a minimum of 90 people. And that was individual meetings. And I think I exceeded that by meeting almost 150 people individually just to listen. It was my listening campaign, just to listen to the great things that, that go on in Charter Oak Unified that they wanted to share with me. And then what I did was I went out to every school site and I met with every uh, staff during a staff meeting and I asked them to provide feedback to me and they filled out three by five cards and I had hundreds of cards in front of me. And when we took that information, um, by the end of those 90 days, the pandemic hit and we shut down and we became virtual with everything that we did. But what I did was I took all the information that people provided me and I sat with our board of education and we developed what you have in front of you, what we call our five pillars for success. And everything that we are doing is based off of my listening campaign and the vision that we have for our district. And so uh, the five areas you can see are college and career readiness. It's what do we do as an organization to improve our communication or collaboration so that we're able to strengthen our relationships? Uh, what are we doing with leadership development at all levels of our organization? How are we providing safety and wellness for all of our students and our staff? And as you've heard tonight, um, how are we fiscally being responsible and providing the best facilities within our district? So those are our five overarching pillars. I'm going to take a moment and you can find all these in detail on our website, but just to give you kind of an idea of the things that I heard and, and really where we're going with this. Uh, the first area, obviously, in college and career readiness is we had to shift a little bit of off of our original vision and, and going into this virtual world overnight, we all of a sudden had to become experts on how to deliver instruction virtually. And I gotta tell you, it probably has made us a little bit better uh, in terms of we were really good at delivering instruction in person. And we had a lot of work that we had to put in as, a, as employees and as a staff on how to deliver virtual. And it allowed us to be more collaborative with each other. And it forced us also really to focus on what is the most important thing our kids need to know and how do we deliver that. And so we did a really nice job, I feel, of offering a really robust virtual learning program. And that was because we also, on the backside of that, we provided a lot of professional development to our teachers because we knew the better that they were prepared, it would have more of a positive impact on our students. And again, my opening slide is about the kids. And so we were making all those decisions on what can we do to give the best experience for our students. And we also had the opportunity to explore a variety of best practices to support our students, both socially and emotionally, um, that how that would impact student learning. And we know that for all of us, there's a lot of work that we still have to do in that area because we have pretty much for a year isolated our students. And now we've got to get them back in and, and get them practicing social skills and being able to interact with each other outside of a screen. And then obviously, as we move forward, we want to continue to promote and provide that pathway for student success in both college and careers. Uh, one of the biggest things that um, we have focused on this year is how have we improved communication and, and improving communication is internally within our organization, as well as how do we communicate uh, with our community, because we know that with strong communication and the ability to get people in the room to have really powerful discussions, that's gonna help strengthen our relationship. And we wanna be collaborative and we wanna be supportive of each other. Um, everything that we do is not easy work. And the more that we can recognize that 
and work together, uh, we have much, much better opportunity to be successful as a result of that. And we want to have a positive working relationship. I want every person who comes to Charter Oak every day to come to work. I want them to be excited when they wake up in the morning to come to work. And I want them to feel disappointed when they go home at night. And I want that same opportunity for our kids. I want them to know that that's a great place for them to be. And, and we need to continue working on building that. And we know that when we can support all of our employees, that's going to have a huge impact on student achievement. And so as we're bringing kids back into person, uh, we're excited about being able to practice those skills so that we can give our students the best opportunity possible. Our third area, and, and we try to do a lot of this right now with our management team, but we will eventually expand this with our parents, with our uh, teachers, with our classified staff, and also with our students. And, it's how do we develop leaders at all level of our organization and uh, being able to provide activities and skills that build leadership skills. And like I said, for this year, we really focused on that with our management team. Uh, because of our two new board members this year, we've also been trying to work through on how to onboard them and how to bring our board members uh, to work as a cohesive team as well uh, through workshops and communication. And then um, one of the big areas is working extremely collaborative with both of our labor associations so that we realize that we have to be able to communicate with each other and, and we need our labor associations to be as much as leaders as our management team because that again has a positive impact across our district. The fourth area, and we've spent a lot of time on this prior to the pandemic and a lot of time during the pandemic. And it's what can we do as a district to provide the safety and wellness of all of our students and all of our staff. And we know that physical safety is a top priority in any um, school system. And we wanna make sure that we've got updated school emergency plans that people understand what those plans are. We wanna make sure that we're providing counseling to support social emotional uh, support to our students. But one of the things I'm really proud of our board last July that we, um, our board of education approved about a three and a half million dollar package that really allowed us to bring our campuses up to 21st century technology. And what I mean by that is we have, we're in the process of finishing an installation on all campuses of state of the art cameras, uh, for, cameras for surveillance uh, we're putting in a visitor management system at each of our schools. We are upgrading our fencing so that when visitors come on campus, it forces them to come to the office to use our visitor management system to be checked in, to receive a badge so that we know that they have permission to get on the campus. Uh, we're doing some upgrades in our, in our classroom. We're upgrading our intercom system so that not only can we make verbal announcements, but also uh, LED, LED displays so that in the event that there is an emergency and we can't make a verbal, we can put a display up in a classroom so that our teachers and our students know what they should be doing next. And I think that's really huge. And we are also in the process right now of upgrading all of our doors district-wide into a, a keyless management system. So that again, in the event of an emergency, we've got the ability to lock all of our doors and nobody needs to go outside to do so. No one needs to fumble for a key. And so all those things will be in place within the next couple of months on some of these and the next six months on the rest of them. So we're really excited about uh, the work that we're doing with that. Um, as we've been preparing to bring our students back, uh, we have also been providing vaccinations to our employees. And so uh, we have probably over 70% of our employees are vaccinated and uh, they're excited to come back to work. So what's that gonna look like? Well, as we're coming back, we're gonna begin a phase in pro process. Uh, we will come back with hybrid instruction and we're gonna be uh, bringing back our TK through first graders right after spring break, starting with them on April 6th. And then each week we'll begin to phase in another set of classes. So by the week of April 26th, we will have all of our TK through 12 students back in class and, and we're really excited. We have spent a lot of time preparing for a hybrid setting. We know that we have families who still want to attend virtually. So we want to honor that request and we're going to be able to provide 
that opportunity to them. But we also know that we have obviously families that want to return. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been really frustrating. We had been preparing for months with a hybrid and then the rules changed on us. And so what we decided to do is to continue with the hybrid for a couple of weeks. We'll evaluate how that phase in process is going. And then we'll meet with all of our stakeholders to determine if we're gonna make any adjustments or changes off of that. Uh, we wanna go slow. We wanna be aware of the fact that we want people to remain safe. Uh, I think we have done a lot in regards to our return of our students. Um, we have a really robust cleaning plan put in place. We've gone out and bought all the personal protective equipment. Uh, we even went above and beyond. Um, there were basic recommendations. In addition to that, we are putting high quality HEPA filters in every classroom, every office. We're replacing all of the air filter systems to the most state-of-the-art upgraded systems. Uh, we are putting the plastic shields around each desk just to add added protection. We obviously have all the signage in place and whatnot. And so I feel really confident with the work that all of our teams have done is that we are excited to welcome our kids back and we're gonna give them a very safe environment uh, to come back and learn. But more importantly, when we return, we're gonna spend a lot of time trying to connect with kids. If you think about it, a kindergarten student has never met their teacher before. All they know them by is this little square on their camera, uh, on their screen. And so we're gonna do a lot of work with connecting with kids when they first come back. And then we'll continue working with the curriculum and, and be working you know, to try to bring them up to speed on where they've been. Uh, graduation, uh, we are offering a full in-person graduation at both of our high schools, as well as our middle school and our elementary schools. We'll provide uh, promotional activities for them as well. And we're excited about offering that being in-person. We know last year we had to do a virtual setting. And so we are beyond that and we're ready to move forward. And more information will come out as that starts to develop over the coming weeks of what that will look like for our class of 2021. Um, our last pillar, just in terms of being fiscally responsible, when I first came to the district, uh, unfortunately, uh, we inherited a, a really strong deficit and we were able to be able to come in and we, we really analyzed uh, the work that has been done with our budget. And uh, unfortunately, our first couple of budgets that we submitted to the county, they were qualified budgets, which is not necessarily where a district wants to be. But I can proudly tell you our last two budgets that we've submitted to the county have been positive. And um, I'm really excited that everyone has come together to put together a budget that uh, makes sense. Uh, it is something that really defines what we're about. But more importantly, we're balancing our budget at this point, and, and that's really good. Um, also, you know, again, we continue to work on making sure that our facilities are safe and clean. I talked a little bit about what that looks like. We want we've um, our whole summer, as well as in the fall, we have provided healthy and nutritional meals to all of our students, and we were able to provide that. We never stopped that at all during the school shutdown, and uh, along with our daycare facilities, we were able to still provide those services to our district. So again, these are the five overarching pillars for our success. These are just a couple of highlights. Again, you could go on our website. You could read in depth all the things that we are doing in each of these areas. And, uh, and I'm really proud of just the work that we've done really in the last year. And of that year with about 10 months of it, you know, kind of being locked up virtually. And uh, I feel like we've made a lot of progress and I know there are just amazing things ahead of us. And I just appreciate everybody's support in doing that. Um, as we move forward, again, we, our intention is, is to open up school in August with putting every student who wants to come back in person five days a week, full time, ready to go. Um, we want to make sure that we are providing the best teaching environment uh, for all of our teachers so that that has a positive impact on our students. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to communicate and build both those internal and external relationships. Uh, developing those leaders at all levels is really important to me, and then providing the safety and the wellness for all of our students and staff. And again, still maintaining that fiscal responsibility with our budget. So Joe, that kind of wraps up uh, Charter Oak Unified. Again, uh, we appreciate your support on this, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Jordan, for your presentation. It was just fantastic, fantastic. Let me uh, bring back in Dr. Perry and Dr. De Leon. Yeah, spotlight. There we go. I'm glad I figured out how to do do this. <laughs> um, again, thank thank you all for your your presentation. I mean, it was a lot of information, and I'm sure the audience watching um, got a lot out of it. Um, there were several questions that were asked, and I, I see you wrote in answers, but I thought maybe we just do a quick review on a few of them. Um, so, because I know some people are on, like on their phones, just listening, that kind of stuff. But one for uh, Dr. Perry was in regards to enrollment, um, being that uh, the students haven't been able to school, has en enrollment maintained? Yeah, we have done, uh, trying to maintain our enrollment. It has dropped slightly. Uh, in terms of student headcount and the number of students who are taking units, that has dropped slightly. Mm -hmm. There was a, a question on cosmetology in particular. And interestingly, that program transitioned to online and the students were able to keep up both lecture and theory and practical. So uh, we didn't lose enrollment in cosmetology. Uh, we made a great transition with all of our lab classes as well, all the health sciences, chemistry, biology, all transitioned online. But as the state and nation are all seen in community colleges, there has been a dip in enrollment. Uh, we're on the lighter side in comparison to our sister institutions in terms of the drop in enrollment. So we're glad about that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there was also a question, um, it re referenced Glen Glendora High School, but I'm sure I mean both districts, this would be an important thing to know is when the students go back, um, will they need to bring their own personal laptops to school? I don't know. If I, I'll go ahead and answer for, for Glendora. Um, we are encouraging our students to do that just because they have all of their programs already uploaded onto their laptops. If they have whatever, whatever they were using for remote learning to bring it with them. Of course, if they're using, they were using a desktop at home, we will be happy to provide them with a Chromebook uh, when they come to school. So we've, we've got that all ready to go for them. Yeah, Joe, and for Charter Oak, um, we've issued a Chromebook to every one of our students. And uh, we have made a decision that that's going to become the new norm. Uh, we will, from this point on, we will invest our, our budget to make sure that we're doing upgrades with our Chromebooks. But what we've learned is that that's a, a nice technology resource for them. And uh, like we issue textbooks, we will issue a, a, a Chromebook every year and um, use our Google Classroom in a, an association with other learning opportunities. So we're really excited about that. That's one thing that we learned coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah it seems like even though there's, there's a lot of issues with this, a lot of new stuff's going to come, come out of it. I mean, I know, I know especially in the, the business world has changed a lot and a lot of it's not, not going away. Um, there may be one, one more question I see here, regards to the timing. I know this may be difficult to, to answer, but I know schools are opening up, but in a smaller block, not the normal, you know, eight to two or that kind of stuff, you know, the four hour block. Can you just maybe just a quick kind of why that little block? Sure, Joe, I'll go ahead and answer. We're, when we bring our students back on April 12th, uh, to in-person instruction um, every day, we will be releasing them at lunch with grab and go lunches. And the reason being is that um, our students need to stay in their classrooms, uh, in their classroom cohorts and or their pods. And we, they, if we allowed them all to go out to lunch, they'd be mixing and then we would not have the supervision um, our teachers, they deserve their lunch. <laughs> and so we don't have the supervision to um, watch all of those kids and keep them apart and keep their, them from mixing their cohorts during lunch. And so it's really a safety issue. So we will have them um, grab their lunch and egress according to their site specific uh, plan for egress. Okay. Um. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Dr. Jordan. Yeah, I can just add a little bit. Um, one of the things we heard loud and clear from our community was when we did return, they wanted hopefully the least amount of change possible. People didn't want to change teachers. They did not want to change schools. And so what we made that decision is knowing that we would have for some of our kids 
a maximum of about eight weeks of instruction and for some of them as little as maybe six weeks. Uh, so we kept the exact same schedule that they've had all year. But what we do is as soon as lunch is over, we're also doing the grab and go lunches for the same reasons that, that Penny talked about. But our afternoons still are opportunities to provide tutoring, uh, other school activities, clubs, you know, all of our athletics are back at our schools. Uh, we've got performing arts groups that are performing in the afternoon. Yes. So our afternoons still are full. Uh, they're just a little bit different than what we're used to. And, and that way we didn't have to change our schedule all around for just a short period. Great. Okay. It's, it's pivot, right? <laughs> it's been the you've got to pivot. pivot time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, actually, one question just came in. It was, it said, you know, to uh, Glendora Unified, but I mean, both districts, um, maybe could you give a little more info on kids who are staying remote? You know, like we all know, some kids aren't going to want to, but they're not going to come back live, but some are. How are the kids staying home going to still receive their education? Um, I'll go ahead and go. Um, if you like, unless you'd like to go first, Jeff, totally up to you. <laughs> um, well, in a couple different ways. So um, at our elementary level, we have we actually have teachers who are staying home on uh, to be teaching remotely um, because of whatever accommodations that they have. And so um, those teachers will be teaching our elementary students. There are very few that have decided to stay home at the elementary level um, for remote learning, but we ought, of course want them to continue to have an amazing education. Um, and so they will have uh, those teachers who are also staying remote. And then at the secondary level, since we have more students staying at home, our, our teachers will be um, teaching them in a hybrid model um, with the students projected up onto a projection screen or a web, with webcam, live streaming, that kind of thing. So that, that is what will happen for the students who are remote. Great. Yeah, and for us, Joe, um, very similar. One of the things, again, so that we had the least amount of change with our students, and one of the things that we also wanted to make sure that we provided was the ability for the families who did want to stay remote. We did not want them to have to change teachers or, or like I mentioned, or schools or anything like that. So what we're doing for the rest of this year is we're going to live stream every class. And so we have upgraded in each classroom a teaching station for our teachers who've got new laptops. They've got a 32 inch monitor to project kids up. They've got their smart boards. Uh, they've got their cameras, uh, their intercom system. All those things are a part of that. And so uh, this gives our families the flexibility. If they want in-person instruction on the days that they're assigned to come, they can come. If a student is not feeling well that day, then they can stay home that day and get the exact same instruction from home, where in the past they would miss a day, and now they fall behind, now they've got to um, do makeup work, and, and you know it's just a work on everybody to bring them back and forth. And so here, uh, we are giving them that option to come in and out on any given day to be able to get their instruction. So we're excited about that, and, uh, and hope that uh, that will help support everybody. Great, great. So I'll jump into, although we don't have block schedules, um, like the K through 12, we have close to 12,000 students enrolled right now mm -hmm. uh, in the spring. And what we've been doing and what we're anticipating for the fall as well, basically some students will remain um, basically online. Mm -hmm. Some have the opportunity to do hybrid where we'll have students come in some days of the week and be online some days of the week. And then some areas will have totally on campus where you have more of the hands-on like allied health, nursing, dental, automotive technology. And then as we move along in the fall, we'll transition some of the lab classes, the chemistry, biology, anatomy, physiology to on-campus as well. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think the online hybrid is kind of here to stay at like at the college level? I think a lot of new things that we've done during the pandemic are here to stay. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a mix. There's a mix of students who really prefer to be online or have hybrid mm -hmm. uh, as well with our faculty and staff. And then you have some students who really feel they want to be on campus and have that in-person experience. 
But I do think we're going to see some growth in on online and hybrid classes after this experience. Sure. Great. Great. Okay. Well, um, that's all the questions, but maybe I'll do one last comment to Dr. Perry. I know you're going to be retiring here. You're not supposed to bring that up, Joe. <laughs> but I just want to publicly congratulate you, you know, um, and it's just, it's going to be a huge miss to the college and, and to the community um, and, and the chamber. <laughs> I've worked with you since I've been, been, been here too. And um, so, you know, wish you well in your, your retirement and I hope you, you enjoy that and, uh, and just have fun with it. So thank you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Okay. Well, if we don't have any other, any final words to anybody or good. Okay. Well, um, we hope, you know, to the people watching this, we hope you enjoyed the presentation of 2021 Glendora State of the Schools. And I again, like to thank Dr. Perry, Dr. Daly and Dr. Jordan for being with us tonight. Uh, it's it's a true honor to work with you all. I mean, it, it truly is. And, um, you know, I'd like thank to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and then just as a reminder, we are going to post this, this recording on our YouTube page and the Glendora State of the Schools website, which is glendorastateofschools.com. Pretty easy to remember. So with that, I, I thank you. I wish you all well and have a great rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you, Joe. Thank you everybody. Good thank night. You, thank Joe. you. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all.